Good afternoon and welcome to our next session entitled Current Ethical and Social and Policy Issues in Newborn Screening Research. I'm Aaron Goldenberg, Professor of Bioethics at the Department of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. I have no disclosures and I want to start by thanking the organizers of the summit at NBSTRN and ACMG for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I am familiar with many of you who are probably watching um, and looking forward to hearing from you and listening to your questions and answering your questions uh, in the Q&A session after we start. So what I thought I would do today is start by going back a little bit, by going back in time a little bit and looking at some of the original LC issues, ethical, legal, and social issues in newborn screening. This is from an article from 1982 called Parental Rights, Child Welfare, and Public Health, where Ruth Faden and colleagues really laid out kind of the ethical foundations of newborn screening and in many ways, newborn screening research around kind of three main ethical principles or three main ethical areas. The first one, as you can imagine, is child welfare, right? The idea of benefiting an individual newborn by identifying them with individual conditions as really that, that ground level ethical, we are doing this for child welfare. And all of you watching are probably thinking, of course, that's, that's why we do newborn screening. And it really provided that ethical foundation. The second principle is the, was the kind of John Stuart Mills, for those of you who took uh, 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 high school and college uh, philosophy, John Stuart Mills harm principle, where the idea is that we can mandate things if they protect others from harm, right? Uh, in this case, the idea of a parent's right to make decisions for their child may be outweighed by the potential harm of a missed positive result, right? And this is really what Found, founded the kind of the mandatory nature of newborn screening right at the beginning in the 1960s and 70s and up through the 80s and to, to today. Um, and then the third kind of ethical principle was really the idea of universal access. And we're gonna kind of be coming back to the idea of universal access later when we talk about new, new equity issues in newborn screening. But basically the, you know, the, 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 the core ethical tenant that every newborn has a right to access newborn screening and should be able to access it regardless of their socioeconomic conditions, regardless of where they're born. And these three kind of ethical principles have been woven through newborn screening for the last almost 60 years uh, and, and really kind of have been the foundation of the ways in which we think about ethics in newborn screening. Um, but as we all know, newborn screening has changed significantly over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and, and newborn screening research particularly has changed as we've started to do research projects and studies and pilot studies that target, for example, new conditions with a wider range of risk, a wider range of uh, severity, a wider range of phenotypic expression. We've looked in, and studied um, conditions that may have later onset, whether though that is later childhood onset or adult onset. Um, we've looked at uh, you know, potentially giving carrier status or looking at what the implications of getting carrier status through a newborn screen might have for families. And then potential impact on reproductive choices, whether those are the reproductive choices of, of the parents themselves for future children or whether that's the impact on reproductive choices of the newborn when they grow, when they grow up. Um, research also targets new treatments, as we all know, and those treatments have also evolved over time. Um, some of the treatments may be more invasive than we've seen, so stem cell transplants, interthecal enzyme replacement therapy. Um, they may be more expensive, such as Spinraza for SMA patients for gene therapies that we're starting to see that are incredibly expensive. As newborn screening research has looked at this maybe wider range or wider um, scope of newborn screening, it's important to then ask ourselves, have the ethics changed? Have the ethics of newborn screening also evolved? Um, my kids are very fond, I have two little, little kids are very fond of the Berenstein Bears old hat, new hat uh, um, uh, book. Um, and so uh, joking with some colleagues, we started to say, do we need, do we have old LC and new LC, right? Uh, um, is it time for us to be thinking about LC differently? And that's kind of why we titled this talk LC 2.0. Um, but you'll see, uh, spoiler alert, in the future, we'll see that things maybe haven't changed as much, and we're just looking at things through new lenses and thinking about new important concepts in LC. Um, and that's really what we want to do today, where I really like to go today. So what are some of the kind of maybe newer or, or important ethical and 
social challenges to newborn screening and newborn screening research. Um, and I want to start with three examples. Um, one is the potential psychosocial impact of newborn screening information, whether given through screening or through research, uh, for example, testing a new condition or trying a new essay. Um, and, and clearly one of the main issues that we'll talk about here is kind of the increased uncertainty of the kind of information being given to families. Again, whether it's through screening or whether it's through a research project, uh, and what does that mean for families? Um, we'll talk a little bit about new kind of new issues and uh, issues around testing children. Uh, through research. Um, so what are the ethical implications of giving adult onset uh, information, carrier status information, and we're going to look at um, what we in the ethics world call the right to an open future and how that's been evolving. And then we're going to talk a little bit about informed consent and return of results uh, and, and how maybe things are changing a little bit in those areas as well. And then what we're going to finish off is some of the new policies regarding research that I, we think are important for the newborn screening research community to know, um, including some new changes to the common rule uh, that dictate human subjects protections uh, uh, for, uh, for research projects. So that's kind of a little bit of a, of a pathway where we're going today. So I want to start, my whole talk will not be about genome sequencing, but I did want to start by, by saying that, you know, one of the um, biggest challenges to ethics in newborn screening these days, and specifically newborn screening research, has been the integration of genomics into newborn screening. Whether that's meant to be an adjunct screen, like a secondary screen, or whether or not it's the idea of genomics as a replacement technology, in either case, this has very clearly been like a, a, a big part of changing LC issues in newborn screening as we kind of look to the future of both technology and of targets for newborn screening research and then eventually for, for screening itself. Um, and a lot of this has to do with kind of the deluge of complex genetic information and genomic information that families may be receiving, whether that's incidental or secondary findings or uncertain findings. So, you know, the idea that families may receive a lot more than just uh, 40 or 50 conditions, they may be looking at hundreds of conditions and what that means for families. And again, that's not the only thing we're going to be talking about today, but I think it's an important starting place for us to say, where are we going? What, you know, what are the kind of LC issues that are going to be uh, hitting us on the horizon as we, as we move towards new technologies? So, you know, this is, this has definitely been um, part of genetics ethics and also newborn screening ethics for a long time, which is what is the psychosocial or psychological impact of genetic information, right? So there's the fear of increased anxiety. There's the fear of potential psychological harms to families if they get complex information that they either don't know what to do with or that they have uncertain results, that it could hurt family dynamics. We've heard people talk about that, you know, getting bad newborn screening information or uncertain newborn screening information may hurt the relationships between kids and families that we may create what, what has been kind of called patience and waiting, this idea that um, uh, families will have high anxiety and high stress if they think that their child may get sick sometime down the road, um, and potential fears of genetic discrimination or stigmatization, stigmatization based on that genetic information. And I would say the old LC, so we're talking about kind of the ethics of the um, turn of the century, late 90s, early 2000s, was really focused on this idea that we can't give uncertain genomic information to patients because it will destroy their family. It'll increase anxiety, it'll increase psychological harms, and that we should really avoid giving this information. Well, what we found is over time, families actually do really well with information. And as long as they have good clinicians and good researchers they can work with, that families can handle a lot more than maybe we thought that it could before. It's just a matter of making sure we have good education, good information. And so, the question is, in the kind of the new LC, the, 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 the new era, do we maybe give more information? Are we more um, liberal about the kinds of information we give? Um, I'm not ready to say that we should or we shouldn't. What I'm ready to say is that it's time for us to not rely on the same studies that we've been looking at since the late 90s about the potential impact of genetic information. We need to be looking at new forms of genetic information, new forms of uh, 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 of research around giving information to families because the data is just not there. We just don't have enough data. Um, and we need more empirical data to 
uh, help us to better understand the impact of genetic information. And that's really where LC studies and newborn screening and research can come in, which is to give us more information about how families react and how families integrate genetic, complex genetic information and potentially uncertain genetic information into their, into their daily routines, into their daily lives. Um, we also need to think about the potential harms of genetic testing in children that when those research results may be given back to families through a, through a study, whether it's a pilot study or a different kind of you know, newborn screening research study. You know, testing is generally acceptable for early onset conditions, and that goes for research as well. If we're doing research for an early onset condition, we don't really worry so much about whether or not we should give the information back. Where it gets more complicated is, do we give information back if it's an adult onset variant? Do we give information back if it's carrier result? Do we give information back that might impact reproductive choices? This is where the, the ethics gets a little bit more fuzzy, a little bit more complicated, um, because we have had for a long time the concept of a right to an open future, right? This is a concept that was really coined by Joel Feinberg in 1980, not specifically about medicine, just about rights uh, of children. And the idea is that we need to be holding certain rights and trust and that those rights should be saved for when a child becomes an adult so they can make autonomous decisions about themselves. And in this case, about whether or not they want to receive genetic information. And most organizational policies have discouraged returning carrier status or adult onset information to families um, with the idea that we need to protect the right of an open future, right? We need to protect the right of a child to decide to get genetic information when they get older. Um, and that we don't wanna be giving information to parents that, that a child may not want when they get older. Um, and that's really been the watchword of genetics and ethics for a long time. But that is slowly changing as well. There are new LC arguments that are saying, mm, maybe the right to an open future, while important, isn't the ultimate right. Maybe we need to be thinking about the, the, the balancing the right to an open future with parental rights and access to genetic information. The potential that having that information early might allow for future preventative actions or being part of research studies or being part of, uh, of networks of, of individuals who may have a condition in the future. And that, that could give resources to parents. And so there's a, a new thread in the LC world, which is maybe we should be thinking about the best interest standards a little bit more than just rights to an open future. And maybe we need to be thinking about a balance between Yes, allowing a child to make a decision of whether or not they want information when they get older, with also the potential benefits of having information like carrier status or like adult onset status earlier, at, which could allow for families to make preventative medicine decisions, to be thinking about monitoring changes around research related to a particular condition. And so, again, this is like kind of an evolving space where we're starting to think about, well, what families need and what families want. Again, it's not one or the other. It's not that best interest should always trump rights to an open future. It's that we need to be thinking about a balance. We need to be thinking about these things, to, you know, uh, together. Consent, another area that's rapidly evolving, right? So one of the questions that comes up a lot in, in LC is, is informed consent ever possible in things like whole genome sequencing, right? You have high complexity of results, potential long-term impl implications. And I would say maybe the old LC was very much around kind of traditional consent necessary. You need to have full consent, you need to have you know, pages and pages of consent. And I would say that that's also rapidly evolving where kind of in the LC uh, community, we're talking more about, well, what do families need to be able to make informed decisions? What do families need to know about their rights, about the information they may be getting? Um, and that it may be that um, we don't need a 700 page informed consent form in order to make sure families are understanding what they're, what they're consenting to, whether that's in a research study or a clinical, in the clinical world. Um, and so we're trying to be more thoughtful about what it is that we're talking to families about, giving them the information they need, still fulfilling our obligations for consent, but not overwhelming families, not making it more stressful. Um, that has also led to more um, acceptability of a broad consent model in research settings. The idea that I may not know what I may use a sample for down the road, so I'm going to obtain broad consent from an individual or a family to use their spe specimen or their data in future studies. Still giving families lots of information, giving them choice, honoring voluntari voluntariness, but at the same time thinking about kind of long-term um, goals of research where um, 
we may not know what a study may look like in a year, but we still want to be able to make sure we're getting permission from families to use data or samples. Um, and so we want to avoid, you know, this this uh, this image here of, of of something that just overwhelms parents. So that's also kind of been evolving over time. Um, Another area that some of you may be thinking about is, well, what is our obligation to return research results from our research? Um, you know, the kind of old ethical standards really followed what, what we call the therapeutic misconception, right? The idea that we're concerned that individuals and families may think that when they participate in a research study that they're getting care, that they're getting direct medical care, and that that that, that is something we need to be really concerned about and make sure that people know that they're in a study that, that while if they do get benefits from that study, that that's not the primary goal. The primary goal is the research. And we want to try to avoid this idea of the therapeutic misconceptions. That has really evolved over the last 10, 15 years, where now we are really thinking very strongly about, very, very deeply about what our obligations to our research subjects may look like, what our obligations to return information to our research subjects, especially research subjects who are giving their time, their literally their blood, their information, their data to research. And maybe we do actually have some um, obligations to return results to patients. And many studies that I work with are starting to very early on um, um, think about their obligations to return research results and giving those research results back to patients in ways that are meaningful, in ways that engage patients, and, and to, to both honor their participation in the study and um, honor uh, uh, a, um, an obligation to give import, potentially important medical information that's gained through a research study back to subjects. The, it's not that um, there are laws stating that you must give research results back, we're not there yet, but the ethics have, have evolved, have evolved into us thinking that maybe we do actually have more obligations to return research results in many situations. There's a fairly new IOM report, which was chaired by one of our newborn screening ethics colleagues, Jeff Botkin, who many of you may know uh, very well. Um, and that IOM report tried to lay out some recommendations, some new recommendations that said, okay, maybe it's time for us to start thinking more holistically and more deeply about returning research results from our studies. And these are just a couple of the recommendations. I just pulled out a few. If you're interested, please go to the IOM report. You can see all the recommendations right there. But recommendation one, of course, is to determine the conditions under which individual research results may be returned to participants. Very much the idea that we should be very thoughtful at the beginning of a study when we're designing our studies to think about, do we want to return results? Do we think we should be returning results? How might we do that? Um, recommendation nine says we need to ensure transparency regarding return of research results in the consent process. If you are not planning on returning research results in a study, it is really an ethical obligation to make sure you're telling your participants, we are not planning on returning results. If you are planning, then also being transparent about the fact that they will be getting research results. And then I, I wanted to put this last recommendation in, recommendation 10, which says enable understanding of individual research results by research participants. This is very much a core growing tenant in LC work um, in newborn screening research and in other kinds of genetic research, which is that we shouldn't just be giving information back. We shouldn't just be saying, oh, here's your genetic information in an email. We should be making sure that our participants understand what they're being given and understand that this is research information, um, understanding that they may need to go to a clinician to, to um, confirm those results or to get more information. Um, so I, I highly recommend going and looking at all the recommendations, but it's a really nice guide uh, to give researchers more information on how they might approach returning research results in um, newborn screening research settings. So what I wanna do for the second half of, of today is to talk a little bit about some policy issues. And I'm gonna start with a policy issue that may be um, something that many of you are familiar with that you've been thinking about a lot over the last five, six years. Um, but that is the, um, uh, Section 12 of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. So um, as many of you know, the, the Newborn Screening Lives Reauthorization Act has a federal policy that provides support and guidelines for newborn screening uh, uh, nationally. Um, it still, of course, allows for state-run newborn screening programs to, to, to govern their, their own work, but provides some, uh, some resources and some support for, for uh, kind of at a, at a federal level. Um, in 2014, when the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act was reauthorized, 
uh, a, a section 12 was added that defined newborn screening blood spots as human subjects requiring a higher level of consent for any kind of research use. Um, this is different than what the primary common rule federal regulations say about human subjects where newborn screening blood spots would not be con considered human subjects in and of themselves. Um, so it did um, limit what we could do with newborn screening blood spots without certain kinds of consent. And it, um, I think, put a, a damper, it put a, uh, um, uh, um, a uh, barrier, uh, some challenges to doing newborn screening research um, and uh, was a concern for many newborn screening researchers, right? Uh, who wanted to be able to use data and samples for, for research, um, secondarily de-identified uh, uh, data and samples. Um, and what has been a concern for, for a long time. At the same time this was going on, uh, there was a process to update the common rule, 45 CFR part 46, right? This is the federal legislation that governs human subjects research in the United States. Um, it was a policy that except for a few minor changes really had not been updated since the early 1980s. And there was a recent push to say, look, there are overlapping, sometimes arguably inconsistent requirements in the common rule and the HIPAA privacy rule that have been criticized as being overly complex, causing confusion and frustration among investigators, IRBs and others trying to comply with both sets of recommendations, right? So there was this incongruency sometimes with the common rule for research and the HIPAA privacy rule. So there was a, a, a push basically from uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, 14 to, to start a process that was just completed a few years ago to update the common rule, update the human subjects policies. There was also some concern, which as you can imagine relates to newborn screening blood spots about the identifiability of DNA. The question was, is DNA in and itself an identifier just as an email address, a uh, home address, um, in which case, having just DNA without anything else would be considered um, um, would be considered having a human subject and be considered uh, um, you know the need for for higher levels of consent just like you would if you had other kinds of identifiable information um, so the federal policy for the protection of human subjects was kind of officially um, uh, um, uh, onboarded on January 19th 2019. There are still a few parts of it that are still being um, brought on board now, um, uh, but we do have a revised common rule. You can go online, you can read the revised common rule, you can see all the changes that were made. Um, and one of the big questions was what to do about DNA as an identifier, right? What are the risks of having open source genetic information? Is DNA in and of itself a unique identifier? Um, this article came out in 2013 where uh, some researchers at Baylor College of Medicine were able to identify people by their surnames by just using open source data, um, which raised this kind of question, is it time to put higher protections in for DNA, even if it's totally de-identified? Um, and this caused a big concern among the public, among researchers, there was a big debate. Um, and what I can say is that the new common rule, at least as of right now, does not define non-identifiable biospecimens as human subjects. They kind of went uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, I wouldn't say backwards because it was definitely a, a new policy, but they, they, they made the decision that for, for a number of purposes that at least currently non-identifiable biospecimens and DNA samples would not constitute human subjects, right? And so for the research community, there was kind of a sigh of relief. There was a concern that if they did define them as human subjects, it was gonna be a big barrier to research. Um, so the common rule that is the new common rule doesn't, again, again, currently does not define non-identifiable biospecimens. So biospecimens like newborn screening blood spots kind of still fit into the same category of non-identifiable that they did prior to the changes. Um, but that doesn't mean that they didn't make other changes. Um, oh, right. So let's just very quickly talk about whether or not does this nullify section 12? Yes. The idea was that the new rule by redefine, by, by re acknowledging that, but that blood spots and DNA samples are not human subjects, the new common rule would kind of nullify section 12 of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthor Reauthorization Act, right? So the idea is that secondary research with non-identified newborn screening dry blood spots would be treated the same way that secondary research with any other kind of biospecimen would be treated. 
Um, and, and this was a, uh, came as a big relief to many newborn screening researchers who wanted newborn screening to be treated like other kinds of research, which I think is, is very valid. It's a, it's a very logical and a, 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 a way to think about things. We also know that many of you on the call, um, and some of you may, may not, that, that the Newborn Screening uh, Saves Lives Reauthorization Act is up for re-reauthorization. Um, and right now is in the within with the US Senate. Um, and there are now new challenges um, from a number of senators who believe that Section 12 should be kind of re-upped um, and that we should be treating newborn screening samples differently. And this has been a challenge in the reauthorization process because um, I and, and, and others really truly believe that newborn screening samples should be treated just like any other samples. Um, and so more to come on this. Um, um, we can maybe be giving updates throughout the year if people are interested. Um, many of you may on this call may be intricately involved in this process um, and uh, hope that there can be some um, good resolution soon that can um, protect newborn screening research and at the same time protect uh, research participants um, and families. So more to come on this on this topic. Um, so where are we on other areas of the new common rule? So one of the things is that um, the final rule does not, there was, a, there, was a, there was a thought that maybe the final rule would require broad consent for every single kind of biospecimens, even if they were totally de-identified. And again, the new common rule did not do that. The new common rule does not require broad consent for, for using every kind of de-identified biospecimen. Um, but it does provide new elements of consent for when consent is necessary. So for example, if the collection of identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens um, are gonna happen in a study, so let's say you're doing a research study and you may collect biospecimens for future studies, you must now by law put that into your consent form. If you're gonna be returning clinical actionable results, that must also be in your consent form. If you're going to be doing whole genome or whole exome sequencing, that is now a separate element of consent that must be in your consent form. And if you're going to potentially commercially profit from the biospecimen use, you must put that in a consent form. So these are four new elements of consent that are necessary for going into a consent process if you're going to be using biospecimens. So for many of you who do do research with biospecimens, um, if you're getting consent, you need to make sure that that these elements are part of your consent process. And you can work with your local IRB to make sure that those elements are there. The other thing that the new common rule does is it gives more structure, more of a, of a kind of a regulatory backbone for doing broad consent. So, right, so section uh, 116 says broad consent may be obtained in lieu of informed consent obtained in accordance with paragraphs B and C. Um, only with respect to the storage, maintenance, and secondary research use of identifiable private information, identifiable biospecimens, right? So basically, the new rule is saying that, okay, we've had broad consent for a while, now we're going to have a regulatory mechanism for broad consent. And this is a big deal for researchers who want to use broad consent throughout their university or throughout their research. Um, and so, uh, again, go into the common rule, you can see what the, what the new uh, consents uh, sent elements are for broad consent. Um, and the, the idea is that it's meant to help uh, people to build broad consent um, into their studies when they may have an identifiable biospecimen, which may actually be important for newborn screening research. Um, study specific consent or waivers may still be possible, although if you're using broad consent, waivers are going to be a lot rarer. The idea is that IRBs are going to favor when you have an identifiable biospecimen, they're gonna favor broad consent over waiver. And that I think makes sense. The idea being that um, we wanna give families more choices or individuals more choices. Um, that being said, there are some new IRB exemptions for secondary research with biospecimens. So researchers, research uses of private information identifiable biospecimens is now a new, uh, is now a new um, exemption storage or maintenance for secondary research, use of private information or identifiable biospecimens, and research involving the use of private information or identifiable biospecimens that have been stored or maintained previously also fit within the context of uh, some new exemptions. Now, these are not exemptions that you can just say, oh, I'm storing previously collected data. I don't have to go to the IRB. No, what they're saying is you still need to go to the IRB but that the IRB now has new areas of exemptions, new uh, pathways of exemptions that can uh, be used for research. 
What the IRB will do will still assure that privacy and confidentiality safeguards are in place. Um, uh, and so the idea is that you may have research using secondary biospecimens that may fit into one of these IRB exemptions, but you still need to go to the IRB to make sure that you, that, that you qualify for an exemption. There's some confusion over what that limited review would look like, and we're hoping that soon we'll get some more guidance from Office of Human Research Protections on what that kind of limited review for an exemption might look like. So my recommendation is that if you have any questions, go to your IRB, submit it anyway, you may still qualify for one of these exemptions, but let the IRB determine, uh, your, your institutional IRB determine whether or not you fit one of these new exemptions. They also help you to think about a broad consent model or a full consent model, uh, if, that, if, if that may be the, the right pathway for you. So I know I've kind of gone through lots of different, you know, um, uh, new policies. What I would recommend is kind of going, reading, looking at the new uh, common rule, talking to your IRB about it. Um, and we'll also have some resources on the NBSTRN website that will also help you to get you to different pieces of the common rule that will be important for your research going forward. Um, so what's missing from the common rule updates? So one, there's not really clear guidance to operationalize all these updates. So broad consent, for example. The other thing that's important for us as the newborn screening community is there's not a lot of guidance for what you do when you have QI or QI, QA, QI or program improvements, right? We were hoping that the new common rule would really delineate what's QI and QA and what's research, and it really didn't. Um, uh, the idea of the identifiability of DNA, while they said that DNA is not considered identifiable, it, the idea is that it's going to be re-examined hopefully this coming year, and that it would be then re-examined every four years. So that at some point in the future, we may get to a point where they say, oh, yeah, you know, it's time. DNA is now identifiable as, as you know, in and of itself. Um, the new rules also do not add any regulations regarding investigator accountability, which is something that we've been thinking about. Um, and it's a little unclear how the new administration's orders, there was, a, oh, I should say not the new administration, this is really actually the last administration, um, had some orders about when, um, execution of new regulations would come into place. That's pretty much been taken care of as the new regs have, have really come on board at this point. Um, so this is, I just wanna talk very just briefly that for ELSI and ethics, um, the blurring of the lines between clinical care and services, quality assessment and improvement in pilot studies are making it actually harder, I think, for, for, for us to um, really solidify kind of new ELSI challenges um, because there have been a number of cases and a number of situations where there's been a blurring of the lines between these two. And on one hand, it can make things really um, better by allowing for more um, integration between clinical services and pilot studies, getting parents to say yes to being in research or, or ask, I should say, asking parents to be in research studies. Um, um, uh, those, those that blurring can actually help sometimes to build research projects. On the other hand, it's hard when you're thinking about regulatory and LC challenges, if it's hard to know, well, what's clinical service? What's quality assessment? What's a research study? And this is something that I think we as a newborn screening community should be looking towards as a new LC challenge, as a new LC issue that we should be working on together, which is how do we really build um, these challenges together? And, and think about the distinction between these two. Um, some of you may be familiar with a, a, a court case uh, that's ongoing right now in Michigan. Uh, it will be this fall going to a full hearing or uh, uh, to, to make a decision, but the preliminary um, uh, opinions from the judges have uh, stated that it may be that storing uh, newborn screening blood spots for research may be unconstitutional. This is not a done deal. This is something that's evolving rapidly. Um, one of the arguments is that parents should be able to direct the health care of their child and that research, uh, the storage and, re and, 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 and research use of samples is part of that health care. And again, for me personally, that is maybe a blurring of lines between research and clinical work. Um, and so it's, it is something that we're going to be dealing with over the next few years um, that we should be dealing with together. We should be dealing collectively, listening to families, listening to to policymakers, listening to ethicists, listening to newborn screeners, to try to think about what the implications uh, of some of these, you know, some of these hearings, some of these lawsuits may be for protecting children and at the same time protecting research studies. I think that that's going to be really, really important because I do think that some of the lines between clinical services 
and the direct in clinical services are being a little bit blurred between that and um, uh, um, research. More to come on this. Uh, this will be something that we'll definitely be talking about in the future. So the question is then, is it really a new LC? Um, uh, are we really talking about old LC and new LC? And I don't really think it's really so much of a new LC. I think it's really about looking through LC through new lenses. Here's my daughter um, at the beach. Um, <laughs> um, she'd be very embarrassed that I'm using this, but um, uh, I really do think it's about looking at LC through new lenses. Um, there have been changes in societal views over the last 50 years. So concerns about how our samples are used coming up in the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks in lawsuits in Michigan and Texas and Minnesota. Um, there are concerns about how do families, what, what families and individuals know about how their samples and data are used in research. And we should be thoughtful about that. We should be thoughtful about how we can integrate familial values and individual values into the ways we build our research projects. There's also much more uh, involvement, and I think this is great, in advocacy organizations who are working with researchers and, and working with families to try to promote research projects. This is, a, this is a new world where we are hopefully building things together collectively. And that means thinking about values slightly differently. That means thinking about ethics slightly differently. We know equity is a huge issue in newborn screening research right now. Uh, genetic research, you can look at the chart on the screen right here. There's been a persistent bias in in genetic research, not specifically newborn screening research, but it falls into that category, in, in, in genetic research, where we know that even over time, while uh, uh, our studies have gotten slightly more diverse, most of our research studies still are, are largely um, um, uh, of participants of European ancestry, um, and that we need to be thinking about what biases that introduces into our research if we don't have diverse, um, uh, diverse participation, right? If we don't have uh, research participation from um, diverse populations and from, from underrepresented communities. So we have to be very thoughtful about what kinds of eth equity issues um, um, are in a number of ways, right? So I have a, here, I talk about eth equity issues are pervasive in a number of areas. So one in access to research participation and research education and engagement. We know that many underserved and underrepresented families are never asked to participate in research or feel that they are not um, included in research studies. So we need to think about equitable access to even research participation. We need to think about the potential systematic discrimination and stigmatization in research and in how research is interpreted, right? What does this mean uh, when uh, communities, um, underrepresented communities, uh, are part of research studies that might potentially further stigmatize their communities. We need to be very thoughtful about that. And we need to think beyond only research participation. We need to think about benefit sharing. What happens after the research is done? Can we make sure that underserved and underrepresented communities are receiving the benefits of the research that they are participating in? So I would say one of the new lenses that I think is crucial for us to be thinking about in the world of LC and newborn screening research is one of equity is around diversity and equity in the ways in which we approach newborn screening research. The other one is really about uncertainty. And I've talked about this a little bit, so I'll, I'll try to talk about this fairly quickly so we can get to our Q&A. Um, we know that there have been a number of studies that have shown that, for example, moving towards genomic sequencing might decrease false positives, and, uh, um, uh, but at the same time might actually increase uncertainty. Um, this study uh, by ANOVA um, uh, showed that while um, do, doing whole genome sequencing or, or genome sequencing instead of traditional newborn screening did reduce false positives, but increased uncertain results. So that's the other lens that I think we need to be thinking about is what are, we, what are the ethical challenges of uncertainty in newborn screening? Uh, and then I'll, I'll end by talking about the importance of engaging ethics in LC. Um, we need better engagement with state programs, with parents, with research organizations to think about LC issues together, so rather than just having the one LC person in the room or having, you know, we need to be doing this collectively. We also need more empirical data on LC. An um, uh, uh, article that, that uh, was published a few years ago in Genetics and Medicine that some of you on this call may have been authors on, and I thank you so much for your participation on that project. Um, we wrote a paper in Genetics and Medicine from M the NBSTRN uh, uh, Bioethics and Legal Work Group to help people in integrate LC questions into newborn screening pilot studies. And we have a series of questions that will help 
researchers. So I encourage um, those researchers on the call to go look at this article and think about how they might integrate LC questions into their work. Much of what we do in newborn screening research already is LC. When you think about the implications, both physical and psychological, of giving information to families, that's that's LC. So we we do do a lot of LC. Um, but we need to sometimes maybe think deeper than just consent issues. How many times have we talked about the LC question and it's about consent? And that's, in, that's important, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to think about disparities. We need to think about the impact of information on families. We need to think about what are the ethics of not doing anything? What are the ethics of what we'll call inaction? And we need to think about resources and resource allocation. If COVID has taught us, uh, COVID has taught us lots of things. One of the things is that we need to be very careful about how we allocate resources to make sure we can keep programs going. What are the ethics of, of that? What are the ethics of, of doing that? So with that, I'm gonna end. Um, I wanna thank the NBSTRN and ACMG staff for having me. I wanna thank uh, some of my colleagues, Beth Trini, Amy Gaviglio, and Natasha Banam, who have really helped me think about these issues and think about new lc -ish challenges in, in, in newborn screening. Um, here's my daughter getting her um, she's me very embarrassed because now I have two pictures of her in this in this presentation for my daughter getting her newborn screening um, done. Um, I look forward to your questions. I look forward to exploring new LC issues in the future with all of you um, and where this can take us together. Thank you so much.